morning. You may be seated. Thank you. Good morning, and please join me in John chapter 10 for the reading of the text that we'll be studying this morning in our worship time. John chapter 10, and I will begin at verse 22, and we'll work our way through to the end of the chapter. John chapter 10, beginning verse 22. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him, and Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Jesus answered them, Has it not been written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him, who the Father sanctified and sent into the world, You are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Therefore, they were seeking again to seize him, and he he eluded their grasp. And as he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing, and he was staying there, and many came to him and were saying, while John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. Many believed in him there. Our gracious God in heaven, we do ask for your holy, your divine intrusion into our thoughts and into our very souls this morning that the words that we're going to study together that are written before us on these pages will penetrate within our hearts, that you will activate them within our thinking and within our hearts so that we not only understand, but we apply them to our very lives. Father, it's our hope and desire that because we've gathered in the name of your Son this morning, we shall also be sanctified by him that by your good and capable hand you will work within us that transformation that takes us more and more away from the old man of sin and more and more into the likeness of your son. And as a result, when we get up and we leave this place and we start a new week, we can enter into our world as the light of Christ that we're called to be, that we're to be the salt of the earth, again, that you have called us to be. Help us to be effective in our our ministry, in presenting Christ to the world around us. And if that is to occur, Father, we depend entirely on your transforming work with us this morning. So would you have our way with our hearts and minds? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I think that many of us have seen a a very dramatic week um, with our election process even And I have to say, like many of you, I can be astounded by where our nation is going. Um, It is good to be a people, a church that prays for our leaders, the leaders that are about to take office, the leaders that will continue in office, the direction of our country. But sometimes I think all reason is lost to us. We have been for many years struggling at relationships between men and women. 
So as a nation, we've decided the easy way to help that is just to eliminate the children that those relationships create. And we make it legal to kill those unborn babies. That didn't seem to help. So in our state, we're going to start younger on our generation now, I guess, and we're going to teach them how to initiate those man and woman relationships, even as young as first and second grade. That's our reasoning. We look at the terrible drug abuse that has been devastating to our culture, and we determine by reason, again, let's simply make the, that drug use now legal. That should help. We look at social injustice, and we figure that the, the help for that is going to be to create chaos in the streets of our cities, to create crime, to steal, to break, to disrupt, and even to kill, and that should help. But it hasn't seemed to help, so we figure, well, perhaps we need to take policemen off the streets. Maybe that will help. It does seem that we've lost all reason. And as I turn our attention to John chapter 10, you have to wonder how these Jewish religious leaders, the Pharisees, reasoned or processed their way through the reality of who Jesus Christ is because every evidence was clearly stated by God in regard to the deity, the credibility, the integrity of his son. And this is what is highlighted in our text before us. There is a debate taking place here, not all that much different than debates that are going on among us in this nation. There's a debate here. There are different views being presented. And Jesus here is confronted by these religious rulers who deny what is obvious about the person of the Son of God. In this second half of John chapter 10, beginning with verse 22, John has recorded a separate discourse on the identity of Jesus Christ. Remember last week, the first half of John 10, the second half of John 10, they are separated by a couple months worth time. And in this second half, the discourse is actually a debate between Jesus Christ and the religious experts of his day who have surrounded him and confronted him in the temple. They demand a clear statement from Jesus. Tell us right out, do you claim to be the Messiah of God? And Jesus not only affirmed that claim, but he went further to identify his unity with God the Father, a claim that prompted the Jews to pick up stones and kill him. We're going to continue our study of the unity of Father and Son this morning with an emphasis on the life of Jesus Christ from verses 31 to verse 39. This will be what I consider a biblically examined life or biblically examined gospel works that Jesus Christ did while he lived among us. Last week, we left off in our study with the accusation of the Jews that Jesus had blasphemed. And it's in these verses that we'll open up our study this morning that will set the stage for this ongoing discussion or debate. The Jews had made the accusation that Jesus was making himself out to be God, and yet he was clearly just a man. This came as a result of six words from Jesus Christ in verse 30, I and the Father are one. And we're going to pick up here with the response of the Jews and what they objected to in these words. And so where we start this mon morning is going to overlap somewhere where we left off last week with verses 31 to verse 33, because it highlights the point of contention that these Jews had against Jesus Christ. They charged Jesus with claiming to be one with God the Father. And their accusation in their mind was an accusation of blasphemy because they knew what Jesus was claiming to be. They knew what he was saying in his words, I and the Father are one. Jesus was claiming to be God, and they were rejecting that claim. We have many false religions in our day that deny the deity of Jesus Christ. And I believe that this debate is very helpful to us you and I as gospel believers, as we sometimes have to do a face-to-face -face with those that reject the deity of Jesus Christ, and in specific, there are a lot of religious cults 
like the Jehovah's Witness, like the Mormon, that we may have a face-to-face conversation with. John 10 is an excellent text to go to. Or other religions or other people that have no specific religions but who object to Jesus as the Son of God. The Gospel of John is a wonderful place to take people. John chapter 10 is a very clear declaration of who Jesus claimed to be. And as we look at some of these differing religions, these false religions, many of them will claim to be Christians themselves in that they embrace some limited agreement with the Bible. And therefore, they presume to believe in Jesus, but they reject the idea that Jesus is God. They even reject the idea that Jesus claimed to be God. Now, we often refer to these false religions as cults, but we do not regard them as Christian. It is wrong to claim to be a believer or follower of Christ when the Christ they are following is not the Christ of Scripture. Their Christ is not the Christ of the gospel. Theirs is not the Son of God. What is characteristic of the cults that make the claim of being Christian is that they do not believe Jesus to be God. And they do not believe that Jesus even claimed to be God. Yet this is precisely the facts, are they not, of John chapter 10. Jesus did claim to be God, and the Jews knew it. It is why they pick up stones to kill him. This has really been the emphasis of the Apostle John in writing this gospel book. All the way back to chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He opened this narrative to declare that Jesus is the Son of God, God come in flesh, taking on the body of a man. That's laid out in chapter 1, and from that point forward, John continues to show us Jesus, Messiah, Son of God. John concludes his account of Christ by telling his readers in chapter 20, and we've seen this a number of times in our study of John. He writes this narrative so that men may know who Jesus Christ is and knowing him, believe in him, that they might have life in his name. Those who deny that Jesus claimed to be God are simply going to dismiss Jesus' self-reference as the Son of God, as merely a title of adoption rather than as being the very essence and personality of God. Yet when we go back to John 20 and we look at the verse prior to verse 31, this is the words that John writes, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. And then he goes on to say, but I've written what I have here so that you may believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be and that believing you might have life in his name. In other words, John wanted to draw our attention to the works of Christ, how he lived a gospel life before the eyes of men because it exposed his divine nature. It revealed his deity. It taught us that the Son of God is God. And when Jesus is called the Son of God in Scripture, as he does in verse 36, it is supported by the divine works, the divine miracles that he performed. And this is the very subject of the passage before us in John 10. The Jews accused Jesus of blasphemy because he made himself out to be God. And according to Leviticus chapter 24, If somebody blasphemed, the Jews were right to pick up stones and stone them for blasphemy. And the very point of verse 31 of John 10 is that Jesus had openly declared himself to be God. Jesus had just repeatedly spoken of his Father in the previous verses, making himself out to be the Father's Son. Father-Son relationship is hugely proclaimed in John chapter 10. And that father-son relationship, Jesus declares we are one in that relationship. He's declaring we have together, father and son, the authority, the power, and the nature of deity. They were united as one in giving eternal life. If you go back to verses 27, down to verse 30, 
What Jesus is declaring in his unity with the Father is that together with God the Father, we are the givers of eternal life. We have the ability to hold on to the souls of men for all of eternity. This is the work that only God can do. And we notice in this passage, John chapter 10, how Jesus again and again repeats, God is my Father, that personal pronoun, my Father, verse 18, 25, verse 29. But notice also that Jesus calls God the Father, verse 15, 17, and verse 30, making the point that God who is his Father is the one true God and this Father And he are one. Do you think the Jews clearly understood what Jesus was saying? There was no mistake about it. Jesus was claiming to be God. And they objected to it. The Jews wanted to stone Jesus because of this declared unity. But his declaration was not an empty one. Jesus challenges these unbelieving Jews, consider my life, look at my works. Look at what I've accomplished. The unity of Jesus speaks of, and this comes from a scholar, a unity of power and operation. A unity of power and operation, as writes Dr. John Brown. And Jesus challenges men's unbelief, man's unbelief, with the works of his power and operation in today's passage. Jesus observed the Jews taking up stones to hurl at him. And in verse 32, he questions them. Noting they're picking up rocks, he says, I showed you many good works from my father. For which of them are you stoning me? Jesus knows clearly why they're picking up those stones. It's not because of the works. It's because of what he just said in verse 30. He declared, I and the father in one. They pick up stones to stone him. Jesus doesn't question them on what he just declared. Rather, he turns to his works. I've showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? Jesus questions them about his works to challenge their baseless intent to stone him. The Jews respond by showing their lack of interest altogether in the life or the works of Christ. It's not about your works. We don't care about those works. All we care about is what you just proclaimed of yourself. I and the Father are one. You're making yourself out to be God, and yet you are a mere man. So they dismiss entirely what Jesus said in that question, what he was declaring, and the emphasis of where this discussion is going to take us. Number one, notice he says there are many good works. John only writes a few. If you go to the very last verse of the book of John, he's going to make this statement. There are also many other things which Jesus did, which were, if they were written in detail, I suppose even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. That's describing the life of Christ, the works of Christ. John is saying, and whether this is hyperbole or not, John is saying if we were to detail everything Christ did in his life and his ministry, the world itself would not be able to contain the volumes that would be written of it. Not only were there many works that testified of Jesus Christ, but notice Jesus said there are many good works from the Father. Now the Jews could hardly debate that the works that Jesus did were good works. Jesus did the works that were always helpful to human suffering. However, they did object to him doing those works on the Sabbath. And while they may have objected to Jesus claiming his good works were from the Father, they make no attempt to discredit those works. Isn't that interesting? Jesus brings this into the discussion, and all they can say, we don't want to talk about your works. They don't even debate with him that his works were from the Father. Their contention was over his deity. The Jews were only concerned with the claim of Jesus that he and God the Father, the Father, their Father, he was one with God. They clearly understood his meaning, that Jesus had made himself out to be God. Jesus had intended this to be a claim of deity. 
and the Jews definitely understood it that way. However, what they did in this discussion is that they separated the claim of Christ from the works of Christ. They separated his word from his works or his life. And in so doing, they charged Jesus with blasphemy. And Jesus responds, you will observe as we move along in our text, he responds in two ways. First, to correct them with God's word, and second, to challenge them with his works. We're going to pick up, moving in, uh, into our study into verse 34, we're going to pick up with that correction that Jesus Christ brings into this debate as he takes them back to the Old Testament scripture, specifically Psalm 82 and verse 6, as a correction to their mishandling of his claim to deity. They had ignored his works, they had set those aside, but first Jesus corrects their objection to his claim to be God. Jesus questions, has it not been written in your law, I said you are God's? He's quoting the Psalms here, but he refers to it as their law. Jesus is not dismissing the Old Testament law as that which was given to Israel by God. It was given to Israel by Christ himself. Rather, he's making the point that the Old Testament was their possession. God had given it to his chosen people, Israel, as an authority of God's voice over their lives. It was their law. So he's forcing the Jews now to look at the Old Testament scripture and submit to the laws of God. The Old Testament, remember, declared those first five books as God's law. But here the Psalms is referred to as the law. And the Jews embraced the entire Old Testament scripture as God's authoritative law over his people. And therefore, what is written in the Psalms is also the word of God's truth. And these Jews needed to accept it as such, knowing that the Jews took the Old Testament scriptures as God's law. Jesus then quotes Psalm 82 and verse 6, which says... I said, you are gods, and all of you are sons of the Most High. Now, if you were to go back to Psalm 82, which you don't have to open up to that text, but if you read the preceding verses, you would see that God is describing himself through the psalmist, through this Old Testament hymn, he's describing his rebuke of Israel's judges for the injustices in their counsel and their leadership. And in this psalm, these judges were called by God to return to the works of caring for God's people with righteousness and justice. God demanded it of them. And these men were to be representatives of God toward his chosen people. And therefore, as God's representatives, God says they are gods. They are as God to the people of Israel. God has put them in an office of leadership that was to represent the very righteousness of God's laws and the very justices that God wanted executed in his his nation. And yet they had failed. They were not living in justice. They were not leading the people in righteousness. And so God charges you are gods and all of you are the sons of the Most High and yet you're desecrating my nation with injustice and unrighteousness. Jesus takes that reference and applies it to the accusation of the Jews. Since God's word called these men, these mere men, gods, how could they say it was blasphemy for Jesus to say that he was the son of God with the understanding of his unity with the father? Jesus makes the point that God's word can't be broken, meaning there's no corruption found in scripture. It is clear It is authoritative. It is trustworthy. Writer Leon Morris writes that the idea of Scripture not being broken means it is perfectly intelligible. It means that Scripture cannot be emptied of its force by being shown to be erroneous. Jesus is telling these Jews that the Scriptures here refers to human judges as gods and they will not be able to raise a complaint against God doing so. God has declared them to be God's little g because they're representative of the most high God to the people of God with the laws of God. So the Jews, 
that Jesus was confronting simply cannot argue against the law of God as spoken in here in the Psalms. And from this position, Jesus says you cannot, therefore, object to him being called the Son of God since Jesus was sanctified by God and sent by him in the world. Now, remember, he's building a case here. And he's starting with Scripture. The very God of heaven referred to these human judges as gods or representatives of God. And here I am declaring myself to be the Son of God because I was sanctified or set apart by God, sent of God, and one with that God. In this rebuttal, Jesus is not telling these Jews, I'm just like those human gods. Instead, he's using Scripture to correct their disbelief in Jesus as the Son of God. R.C. Sproul writes, this is a lesser to greater argument. In other words, if Scripture approves saying that sinful human judges were acting as gods on behalf of the Father, how much more is Jesus entitled to be called the Son of God since he was sanctified by God, sent by God, and Jesus is one with God the Father. Now, at this point, the Jews will have to argue against the Old Testament Scripture. Well, I don't know what we can do with that, because you're right. God did call men gods. Do you realize what Jesus has done here? He's created a biblical wall. And he's backed these Jews who have circled around him. He's backed them into a corner, walled them in with the authority of God's word. If sinful human judges are called gods, Jesus is entitled all the more to be called the son of God because he was set apart by God, sent by God, and one with God. What are the Jews going to do with that? The only thing they can do is say to Jesus, Prove it. Those are outlandish claims. Prove it. So what does he do? He takes them right back to his works that they had rejected earlier in the argument. I don't want to hear about your works. You've made a claim. So Jesus takes them to the scripture, backs them into the law of God, and it's going to force them to say, well, prove that you are sanctified, sent by, and one with God the Father. Now we open the discussion into his works, which is what they had rejected, and they didn't want to touch that. The confirmation of his deity. Verse 37, 38, and 39, Jesus draws the Jews' attention back to his life. They couldn't deny. If I do not do the works of my Father, don't believe me. But if I do them, though you don't believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Notice that last statement. He takes them right back to verse 30, doesn't he? The unity of Father and Son. And what's going to confirm that unity? That's the very life of Christ. Look at my works. Look at what I do. This is where he leads the debate at least Jesus leaves room for in this debate, some of these men to turn and say, you are who you say you are. Now, Jesus has already said of these men, you're not of my flock, you're not one of my sheep. But it is possible that there may be a Pharisee or two there, like Nicodemus, that is listening and that is going to come to faith. What Jesus has done in this discussion, he's left room for them to acknowledge he is indeed the Son of God. And in this part of the discussion, he challenges these Jews, examine my works, look at what I have done. And as we've mentioned before, these works were largely focusing on the signs and the miracles that Jesus had performed since the whole context of this discussion is one of his deity. And therefore, his works are those works that are going to prove his deity, that he has the power and the operation, as we've talked about before, to give eternal life, to hold on for all eternity the souls of God's people, as he's just stated in verse 27, 28, and 29, that he is the God that can do that. 
So the focus of his works may largely be on his signs and his miracles, but we cannot exclude all the works of Jesus Christ in his gospel ministry, including his obedient life before the Father, his holiness of character, his perfect ethic, his preaching ministry, the preaching truth of God. It is true that the power to make wine from water, to heal a lame man, to to restore sight to a blind, or to feed over 5,000 people from a little boy's sack lunch, that is a testimony to his claim to be the Son of God. And that kind of extraordinary power and authority belongs to God alone. So those works should prove that he is one with the Father. But so also would his works of love and his mercy and kindness and truth. Because that's the character of God, is it not? Jesus demonstrated that perfect righteousness as he lived before men without sin. And if the works of Jesus Christ were not the works of God, then Jesus said, don't believe me. On the other hand, since the Jews already did not believe Jesus, he told them, examine his works to see if the divine nature of God was evident there. His works would confirm who Jesus claimed to be as the Son of God. They would confirm that he and the Father are one. And here Jesus calls the Jews to look at his works as something of an invitation for them to believe that Jesus truly was one with the Father, that the Father was in him and he was in the Father. And the reasoning for examining his works, Jesus said, was that they may know and understand. Do you see that line there? So that they may know and understand. In the original language, Jesus is using that word know twice, to know and to know. Only he changes the tense. And if we read it in that sense, if we read it in that language, Jesus is saying, so that you may come to know and that you may keep on knowing. So you may come to know and you keep on knowing. What does that describe? Saving faith, is it not? So that you may know Christ as the Son of God and keep on knowing him in that way. Jesus is challenging these Jews Carefully examine my life, my works. That he does so, that they would see his divine nature. They would believe on him and they would continue to believe and be saved. Given that these religious leaders in Jerusalem had rejected the miracles and works of Christ, that they had denied his unity with God the Father, that they had picked up stones intending to murder him on the spot, this challenge by Christ, is it not an act of divine mercy. The invitation itself is evidence that this is not a mere man standing in front of them. Only a forgiving God will extend eternal salvation to hostile sinners, and we know this because you and I as believers came from that kind. That's who we were before God called us by his mercy and grace. Paul said this, articulated this to the church in Rome in chapter 5 of Romans, verse 6, 7, and 8. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love toward us In that while we were yet sinners, and we could say while we were yet hostile sinners to Christ, that's when Christ died for us. In truth, none of us deserve even the invitation to come and examine the claims of Christ. We don't deserve to read about the the credible confirmation of his deity as written in his word. We don't deserve to have a book like the scriptures written for us to see Christ. That Jesus would even present these Jews with the opportunity to examine his life was an act of divine mercy, and they didn't see it. Sadly, these Jews would not even take the time to examine the many works or even to have a conversation with Jesus that his works were works of the Father. See what it says in verse 39? What is their response? They were just going to seize hold of him. At least they changed their mind on the stoning, I guess. But they were going to seize him, have him arrested. 
so that they could have him done away with or killed in another means. Apparently, they changed their thinking on stoning Christ, but their thinking had not changed on getting rid of this man. Verse 39 shows us a refusal to examine the testimony and life of Jesus Messiah. It shows us a determined rejection of Jesus as the Son of God. And therefore, Jesus takes his gospel ministry elsewhere. He takes it to fertile ground. Verse 40, And he, Jesus, went away again, having eluded their grasp, as it says in verse 39. He went again to the territory beyond the Jordan to a place where John was first baptizing, and he was staying there. Many came to him and were saying, While John performed no sign, Yet everything John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. We turn our attention now to those last three verses, and we consider the faithful witness of John the Baptist and the effective preaching ministry of Jesus Christ. In both of those men, Christ and John, there is a faithfully executed gospel witness. The apostle John tells us that Jesus had slipped out of Jerusalem to escape the murderous intention of the Jews. Jesus retreated into the early ministry territory of John the Baptist. And we've seen Jesus escape that kind of trouble before, not because he was fearful of death, but because his time for atonement had not yet come. Jesus was on a carefully scripted timetable, and he was committed to be fully obedient to the will of the Father and fulfill his calling as Messiah and Savior. So Jesus escapes, left the Judean area, crossed over the Jordan River, and headed up into the northeastern region where the preaching of John the Baptist was still note well remembered. The people up there still remembered John's ministry. And even up in this territory, it appears that the miracles or the works of Jesus were being talked about Or perhaps he was performing more miracles. And I think the implication of our text is that's what Jesus had done. He'd gone up into that territory where John the Baptist had preached. He also preached, and I believe he did some miracles up there. Because they note that distinction between Jesus and John the Baptist in verse 41. John didn't do any miracles. So perhaps they're noting that Jesus came doing miracles. But what John did do is that he preached the truth about Jesus and these people saw Jesus for who he was, unlike those in Judea. Many believed under that preaching ministry. The Apostle John concludes this story by telling us this was an effective ministry. This was a fruitful ministry because people believed in Jesus as Messiah, Son of God. Now, we might think in writing this narrative, and this is where my mind tends to go, that John the Apostle would have taken far more time telling us the details about believers. We only get three verses. We don't see any detailed miracles. We only get the implication that maybe Jesus performed miracles up there and that John didn't, John the Baptist didn't. Why don't we get more material on the believer? And instead, John the Apostle writes in length about the unbelieving Jews in Jerusalem. We don't know anything about what happened up there in the Northeastern Territory. Did Jesus perform miracles before these people, before giving the testimony that he is the Son of God? Did he show the evidences of, of his divine nature? Did Jesus preach some very moving sermons? Did he have some debates with people that exposed his divine credentials? Why give us so much from the hostile, unbelieving Pharisees in Jerusalem where there was little fruit and yet only three verses were given in this territory where there was much fruit? And I would answer this way. Unbelief has to be exposed if we're going to know what true faith is. Because saving faith, gospel faith, is unique, is it not? Think of how many today claim in our nation to be Christian or claim to have saving faith. 
Think of how many today have faith in something, but not in Christ, but they think they're okay for eternity, that God is okay with what they believe. How are we going to know, how are we going to distinguish between faith and saving faith? Think about these religious rulers in Jerusalem that surrounded Christ and confronted him. Did they have faith? We would say, yes, they did. They believed in God. They believed in the law. They believed in their own righteousness to keep that law. And therefore, in their faith, they believed they were okay with God. God was okay with them. But did they have gospel faith? Did they have saving faith? Did they believe in the true Messiah, Jesus, Son of God? And we would say, no, they did not. And I have to realize here that men of faith nailed God's Son to a cross. Men of faith did that. We have to know unbelief from saving faith. And John does that for us. He spends a lot of time exposing unbelief because we need to know that. It was man's unbelief that brought the Son of God to Calvary, and it was there that salvation would be accomplished for all who would believe. And it is in this light that I think you and I also as true believers, gospel believers, if we are here this morning and our faith is securely anchored in the Christ of scriptures, as believers, we know that we can be subject to weakened faith. Even as believers, we can go too quickly to the ways of the old man, a weakened faith, a feeble faith. It is somewhat strange to us, perhaps, that John's gospel spends so much time on man's unbelief and the stubborn refusal to embrace Jesus as the Son of God. But in a more negative context, I believe there are a few things from our text that would be profitable for us to consider, knowing that even as believers, we can wander back to those ways of unbelief. It is good for us, therefore, to know the details of non-faith. So as we summarize and conclude this morning, consider with me how the sins of jealousy, resentment, and bitterness will cloud our spiritual judgment. They will cloud our spiritual judgment. The Jewish rulers were willingly blind to the perfections of God in His Son. Even the man that was born blind back in chapter 9 confessed that. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard of anyone that opened the eyes of somebody that is born blind. Even he saw it. And therefore, the Jews willingly ignored what Jesus had done to heal the lame, restore sight to the blind. And it doesn't get any better in chapter 11, does it? Jesus is going to raise somebody from the dead. And it is because of that that these Jewish rulers are going to stone Jesus. They want to kill him. Here was a man who overpowered nature, deformities, disease, demonic world, and even death itself. Yet what kept them from faith in Christ was their own sinful hatred for Jesus. In our text this morning, they were willing to ignore the many works of God that Jesus did because they resented the rising prominence of Jesus. They were jealous of his popularity, his biblical wisdom, his rejection of man's self-imposed religion. Jesus rejected man's self-imposed righteousness. Jealousy and resentment caused these religious men to ignore his obvious divine nature. And friends, though we are believers, made spiritually alive by the Spirit of Christ and indwelt by that Spirit, we know the remnant of sin still remains. And if the sin of resentment and jealousy can cause such blindness towards Christ, imagine what it can do to the spiritual discernment in our lives as well. And we see this all too often in our relationships as church men and women. Jealousies, resentment, bitterness, it will cloud our spiritual judgment And we will act inappropriately towards one another. 
in a way that dishonors Christ. We have to be on guard. It is important that we see these traits, these characteristics, these details of unbelief because we can be prone to go back to that weakened faith. Consider, secondly, how your life confirms your testimony. This is a little self-reflection here. In our text, Jesus actually challenged the Jewish leaders to examine his life and to assess his words by the works that he had done. Can we do the same thing? Consider how your life confirms your testimony of faith in Christ. And if people did examine our works, would they see a contradiction in our profession of faith? Now, it is true that the world is not going to approve of our testimony. The world is not going to approve of how we live our lives in the name of Christ. If we stand in support of biblical ethics, we're likely going to be accused by the world of being unloving, without grace, or that we are hypocrites because we're not practicing what we preach as the world thinks we need to practice our faith. But the question is not, does the world approve? The question is, will they see a contradiction between our walk of faith and our profession of faith? Do our works support our words? This was the challenge that Jesus gave to the Jews. Look at my life. And you will know that I am the Son of God. Richard Phillips, in his commentary, writes, and this is on your note sheet, it is fair for people to judge the truth we profess by the life we lead. It's fair for them to do that. To judge the truth we profess by the life we lead. How do we conduct business in the world? How do we act on the job? How do we care for our families? How do we act in our marriages as husbands and wives? What about our devotion to the body of Christ? How do we serve the church? What about our obedience to the laws of Christ? All of these reflect on our claim to be followers of Christ. Christ has called us to be his gospel witnesses. But we must walk as gospel believers if we're to be faithful as gospel preachers. We have to walk as gospel believers if we're going to be faithful as gospel preachers. And third, consider the fruit of a faithful witness. Consider the fruit of a faithful witness. And what do we mean by a faithful witness? It is speaking what is true about Jesus Christ. That's what we read was said of John the Baptist. He preached what is true about Jesus Christ. Now go back and think about his ministry. How does Scripture characterize the ministry? How, do, how does it put a title over the ministry of John the Baptist? He preached repentance, didn't he? How about his baptism? His baptism is described as a baptism of repentance. That is a very uncomfortable ministry. He was calling sinners to repent. Look at how he preached in the first part of Matthew's gospel and how it offended the religious rulers. He had a very awkward and difficult ministry. And yet look at how the word of God commends this man. He preached what is true about Christ. Long after John the Baptist had died, we read these words from our text, that he was faithful to Christ in his preaching. Here is a community that sat under the uncomfortable teaching of John the Baptist, and yet that ministry held fast, didn't it? And then comes Jesus years later, and he preaches the gospel. Many believe Jesus came to fertile territory. Yet we observe how God's word commends the faithfulness of that ministry. Everything John said about this man was, per was true. Perhaps the challenge that God gives to each of us is, will you be faithful to preach what is true about his son? I am not so sure that God is going to be all that concerned about how popular we are with the masses, how funny or char charismatic we are, 
if we put on fancy productions here at the church, or even if we're telling people what is comfortable and easy for them to hear. And I doubt very much that my ministry as I stand before Christ is going to be evaluated on how much moose I put in my hair if I wore skinny jeans and a Burt and Ernie t-shirt. I don't think Jesus really cares about that, or that I wear a tie for that matter. But am I preaching the truth about Christ? Am I declaring what people need to know about the Son of God? We don't generally embrace contemporary methodology here. But I think all of us have been face-to-face with an unbeliever or even family members who are hostile to Christ. And we can be tempted, can we not, to win them over with methodologies rather than just telling them what they need to know about Jesus, Messiah, Son of God. And it's not always an easy ministry. Sometimes we're calling people to repent. We're confronting sin. We're dealing with some hard subjects. But we're bringing the eternal hope into their lives. We have to tell them about Jesus. D.A. Carson wrote, No witness could ask for a better epitaph than what was said here of John the Baptist. All that John said about this man was true. And I suppose that might be a good consideration to have etched on our tombstones when we're done with this life. Here lies a man or a woman that spoke the truth about God's Son. What a great way to end this life. That would be a commendation worth living for. And that's John the Baptist for us here. Right on the pages of Scripture, he told the truth about Jesus Christ. May Jesus find his church so faithful in the end. Father God, we thank you for these moments of worship together. It is truly the glory of your son that has been the centerpiece to our thoughts and our meditations this morning. And yet that can be very convicting to us as children of God, followers of Christ, disciples of Christ. Let our study of your son Reflect upon our lives so that we walk in a way that shows the world Jesus for who he is. Let our message be consistent with our works. Help us, Father, to be courageous and bold with the preaching of Jesus. There are a lot of fancy accoutrements that the church has been caught up with in these days. Let us focus, Father, on the glory of your Son and who he is. And we'll leave the transforming of the heart to you. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.